Danae, thank you so much for making time to chat all things relationship approaches with us on the podcast. Oh, Kirsten, thanks so much for having me. Janae's coming to us from LA, but her wisdom has kind of kept me going. I watch her TikToks all the time. I really encourage <laughs> you guys to get on there and just listen yeah. to her approach because I've personally just learned so much from you from what you put out there in terms of content. Thank you. That's so nice to hear. I appreciate it. Um, I feel like I'm I'm a little bit of an introvert, so I I record a lot of the content that I put on social media at the retreats that I facilitate, and so it it's like an easier way for me to get it done because a lot of times I'm a little bit in resistance when it's just like me talking to a camera the way that people do a lot of times. So I'm happy oh, that it's resonated. Story of my life. Like <laughs> I feel like I spend so much time with myself on screen. I'm always mm. with myself. Um, so before we kick off and dive into, you know, your take on and your wisdom around that, you know, relation kind of pattern and connection, I'd love to know your favorite quote. Mm. Well, I feel like the quote that I come back to so often that those who know me get tired of hearing me say this, but it's been a game changer in my own life and one that I feel like applies to everything. Um, one of my favorite spiritual teachers is Wayne Dyer. And something that I used to hear him say quite often was the mantra of the lower self is I need more. The mantra of the higher self is how do I serve? And time after time, situation after situation, if I get still and ask myself that question, um, it's always really clear what space I'm operating from and where I need to realign accordingly. Oh, that is so beautiful. I mean, his work is just mm. so phenomenal. And I'd actually not heard the start of that quote before, to be honest with you. I often talk about that, the end of that quote, like, you know, how can I serve? And it immediately puts you in a higher vibration, but yes. I'd never heard the start of that quote before. Mm. Yeah. I don't know. I, I certainly think that I heard him say it. Oh, I'm um, sure he, it sounds like exactly like Oprah. something he would say. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it definitely came from him. I remember the first time I heard him say it, thinking, you know, when you hear something and you're like, that's mm. going to be important. Um, I don't know why or the extent to which it's going to really matter, but um, that awareness has been one of the most profound knowings within my life that it just changes everything. It makes it possible for me to do things that are outside of my comfort zone. I think when we're operating from the space of service, a lot mm. of times we can do things that, you know, feel scary or our imposter syndrome kicks in all the things, but if it's about how I'm able to show up in the world and help someone else, it just feels a little bit more feasible. We're able to get there, you know? Oh, for sure. Well, I'd love to hear your story, or even though I know it a little bit, I would love for <laughs> you to share your story with everyone listening, you know, that how you did come to serve mm. people in the way that you do. Oh my gosh. Well, <laughs> I'm like, that's a story, Kirsten. Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't know that it's, it's that much of a story, you know, I'm 44 years old. And so I think the things of life, the human experiences that um, all of us go through my experience with the, the roads that I took to get to the path that I'm on are the ways that I came into being in a greater space of self-acceptance. Um, but I think that they're all like the human things. Um, and, you know, I'm a therapist now and I feel like I'm one of those people that loves therapy, kind of has always loved therapy. I know that's not everybody's experience when they think about therapy or when they think about going to therapy, but um, I was one of those people that like from when I first started doing therapy and that was probably in my mid twenties was just like, this is amazing. And I think I have just always loved the the inquiry around like what drives our human behaviors. Um, kind of a geek when it comes to like Oprah and her soul series and all the spiritual mm -hmm. teachers that she would have on her show. And I think that's probably where I was first introduced to, to Wayne Dyer and other teachers that have really impacted my world. But um, I've just always found the the one, like what motivates our behavior, but then to how we come into deeper layers of healing and seeking comfort. And, um, you know, I've always been a seeker in that way. And I think early on, um, 
I think that that was a struggle for me. I grew up in Omaha, Nebraska, which, um, you know, for those of you who don't know, the States is a very like, you know, Midwestern, um, I'm a woman of color and I was sort of the exception to everyone else. And so I think that it was a lot of like me being really uncomfortable in my skin and struggling with feeling different but also that I'm kind of a sensitive soul and, you know, as many of us are, but I think that like my sensitivity was just like, I was always in the space of like questioning, um, you know, things that felt hard to grapple with, like things I saw happening within my parents' relationship that um, didn't feel very loving or the ways that people were experiencing um, or I was experiencing racism, things like that, that mm -hmm. I felt like the sensitivity to that just made me really sort of like armor up in ways when I was younger and stop being the fullest embodiment of myself and what that means to me today for a while. And I think therapy and the healing work that I've done throughout my journey has sort of been um, my path back to that person that I was before my sensitive soul started to feel really impacted by the world in ways that made me sort of armor up. Um, but I often say that I think that our healing is just like a homecoming. We're coming back to the person we were before we started to negotiate who we were according to the world and what the world told us that we needed to be. And so it's like a reclaiming of self, I think a lot of times, you know. Yeah, for sure. And it's interesting because we're both the same age and, you know, we've lived on opposite sides of the world, but both of us so similar in that seeking. And I think it was, I don't know about you, but interesting growing up, you know, becoming aware in the 90s when mm. Oprah did, you know, really start to talk about this stuff and bring it to more mainstream. And the fact that we were both pulled towards that at the same time and those teachers and although, and those teachings, um, it, and have, having to that, that to be challenged, especially in the early 2000s when we're obviously mm -hmm. as adults going out into the world trying to make our way, but somehow you've managed to merge a scientific approach with a more holistic, maybe a lot of Eastern philosophy, let's call it that, but spiritual approach. Yes. You know, was that easy to do? Well, um the master's program that I went to for psychology is um, based in depth psychology and depth psychology. People often think I'm saying death psychology. It's depth, like the deep um, psychology, which is really based on Jungian psychology, a lot of Carl Jung's work. And um, it's really the psychology of the soul. And so that type of psychology is studying um, the larger spiritual principles and sort of like holding our life through the lens of the hero's journey. And if we zoom out on our life and look at it in the greater context of the story of our lives, what is each chapter helping us to understand about ourselves, helping us to um, grow through the dragons that we end up slaying, um, things like that. And so I think um, I was probably drawn to that school because I was already mm -hmm. so much of a spiritual seeker. But I think that that context of holding the work of um, processing emotions and what's coming up for us really sort of solidified, this is a way that we can work and we can hold the context of healing that's a little bit different than some of the more clinical models of psychology. I, I know you work with individuals as well, but you know, the focus of your work does seem to be around the connection we have with others and mm. relationships. Why did you go that way? What was what was the significance really in that choice for you? Yeah. So what's funny, Kristen, is this is a little like unknown fact about <laughs> about therapists. <laughs> Therapists either love working with couples or they will not work with couples. Really? Um, they don't want to be in the middle. <laughs> they're like, no. And, you know, a lot of that is most of us are pretty activated by conflict for whatever reason. I love it. Like, I think it's like, it's a little bit of a, I don't know if it's a superpower or just like a weird quirk, but it's not that I love it, but I think that. I don't feel super activated by yeah. other people's conflict. I'm able to sort of, I like to, um, say that it's like I I stand back and I can kind of like almost translate what each person is experiencing from the other in a way that feels digestible and feels um, a little bit easier to understand and cultivate some empathy for one another. And I don't know why that was just something, you know, when you um, first finish with grad school, you go into a practicum and you have to work with all the different populations. You have to work with adolescents for a while. You have to work with 
you know, it's community mental health. So whoever comes in, but you have to do a rotation with couples therapy. And I found that like, I was loving the couples therapy and everyone around me was like, that was horrible. They were fighting. They stormed out of the room. They were slamming doors. And I was like, I don't know. I think it's kind of fun. Um, but in my private practice, once I finished in my practicum, it just got to the point where they kept giving me all the couples because nobody else really wanted to work with the couples. And it can be hard to find referrals for um, couples therapists. And, you know, it's so funny. I say often people a lot of times feel like couples therapy doesn't work. Now I have my theories on why that is, but a lot of times I think that there's just a very um, patriarchal, like keeping a certain structure in place that I think isn't really taking into account what brings a lot of relational fulfillment for both people into consideration that um, certainly most of the clinical modalities are still holding from my perspective. I think that there's a way that holding things through the lens of depth psychology and who we are as a soul is a little bit different than how most people work as couples therapists. And so I just found that I had a little bit of a unique spin on what we're meant to be doing relationally. If we um, hold that this is a life school and I believe it is, and that all of us as souls have sort of these divine collisions, people mm -hmm. that um, are sort of our divine assignments and that we are meant to meet to learn certain lessons in our lifetime, then our work relationally is really held with a different level of reverence for not only who this person is in relationship to us, but also who they are as a unique individual soul and what their soul's journey is meant to do. And I think there's, um, you know, most couples therapists are really invested in keeping a secure attachment. And it's not that I, I don't believe in creating secure attachments. I want us to all have as much fulfillment as we possibly can in our relationships. But I always say um, to couples that my work is always to support the relationship container in whatever is the truest, most beautiful expression of that container. And sometimes that means for that container to dissolve in its current form. And that is the most loving expression of how those two souls journey forward. Um, and it's a little bit of a different perspective, I think, than a lot of couples therapists have. But I have found a lot of freedom in working that way and really um, that it just asks a lot more of each person in terms of taking personal responsibility for the energy that they're bringing into the dynamic, which is from what I found the only way that couples therapy ever ends up being effective. It's it's so refreshing to hear a therapist talk this mm -hmm. way because I'm sure you're a big fan of Mark Groves as well, but he talks about that container of that relationship being one in which to grow and expand and learn and all those things and that it is a sacred container and, yes. you know, to move away from, I guess, those lower order egoic type connections such as attachment theory, although, like you say, very has its place. Mm -hmm. But for the soul to be seen to express to learn to evolve and not to feel so for want of a better word attached to an outcome in a relationship rather allow it to be yes absolutely you know I think one of the fundamental things that we are all taught to hold and believe about relationships is that the success of a relationship is based on its longevity. Um, I think we've all been to like a wedding where it's like, you know, the last couple who's been married the longest keep standing and dancing. And we applaud at, you know, yeah. the last couple standing when we don't know anything about what their relationship container has been. We don't know if they've been miserable for 40 years and we're like, yay. Um, and I don't know that I think that it should be based on longevity. I don't, I don't think in any way, shape or form, my marriage changing form was any sort of failure. I look mm -hmm. at it as like a huge success because our friendship has continued and the container has changed form. But I think so often the fear of, um, an attachment being severed, which is usually, usually based on an attachment wound or the fear of being a failure and that we will yeah. be judged societally or, you know, exiled from our family, our friend groups, our peers, because our relationships have ended, keeps us a lot of times in things that aren't really true um, and aren't honoring each person well. We're sort of like living in the resentment of like, this is making me really unhappy because it's no longer in alignment with who I'm becoming. But I feel like 
you know, sign the contract. <laughs> this is the deal. I got to stay here. And I don't know that that serves anyone. For sure. I mean, I work, you know, I work with people all day and it's the biggest thing that people come to me for is that, you know, what's mm. going on with my relationship or when will I be in a relationship? And although we're talking about those romantic connections, we could apply this to friendships as well. Mm. Not often discussed in society, but when a friendship container isn't a sacred <laughs> container mm. or that it has evolved, you know, how do we navigate that, that relationships mm. are supposed to be therapeutic in terms of the soul contracts or the challenges that they're giving us because you talk about therapeutic relationship and although I know that you've touched on it there I would love for you just to unpack that a little bit more in terms of just a different lens on the function and form and the possibilities that relationships really do offer us. Yeah you know I think that our relationships if we're willing to hold them this way are the most sacred mirrors. I think mm-hmm. that relationships like nothing else bring all of our things and our stuff, our pain points to the surface. And we have this opportunity to say, um, all of this is showing me to me. And I think what ends up happening, relationships are these mirrors, you know, they're like the most sacred mirrors showing us to ourselves. And I think all of our pain points, all of our activations, it's like what ends up happening, I find is we sort of choose our unfinished business from um, from childhood, you know? So it's mm. whatever the most challenging relationship with a caregiver was, um, the parent we felt couldn't see us, couldn't love us, couldn't appreciate our quirks in the way that we longed for them to, we will be drawn to someone. And this is sort of the unsexy part of relationships. We will be drawn to someone who reminds us of that caregiver on an unconscious level. And what we are doing is attempting to sort of um, rectify that relationship or heal that wound within us. So it's like what our subconscious is attempting to do is if I can just get this person to love me, then it will mean that I was worthy of love all along right now. Of course, we were always worthy of love, but our work is to really attempt to understand where our shadow is being demonstrated to us. And our shadow is the parts of us that are sort of like our, um, our unconscious motivations, right. That are driving the things that we do and the parts of ourselves that we really have, I love to say, relegated to the basement and we don't want to look at those parts Mm -hmm. of ourselves. That's our shadow work, right? But um, so often we just make it about the other person. And if I can just get this other person to change Mm -hmm. and experience the world the way that I do and love me in the way that I long to be loved when really our work is to be curious about why I need this person to be whoever I believe that I need them to be. Um, What feels historic about this? I love to say if it's hysterical, it's historical. So it normally means that it's something from childhood that we're attempting to get into right relationship with. Um, But that if I love someone, that means that I attempt to love them with radical acceptance of who they are. Now, I did not say like, that means that like, we're aligned to stay in relationship with that person, but we spend a lot of time, I find in our relationships, attempting to change the other person, which one, I don't know anybody who's really ever made a change in their life for any reason other than an authentic desire within themselves to make that change. So it kind of becomes like being our head against a wall, trying to get something to happen that Mm -hmm. just doesn't really happen. But also- I think that we're not really um, in relationship with the person in front of us. We're in relationship with attempting to get our needs met from the space of our inner child. And we're looking for that person to reparent us a lot of times. And so what's interesting is most of the clinical um, relationship models or orientations really advocate for that, right? Like this person like should love you and all of the ways that your parents didn't love you and give you that like, you know, thing that you were, you've been longing to feel for a lifetime. But the thing is, if it doesn't come from a space of, I know this within me that I am worthy of this thing that I'm longing to get from another person it becomes like a bucket with a hole in the bottom. Like that person can fill it and we'll just find another reason why they're not filling it correctly. Um, it, it's never enough unless it comes from like, a really grounded space from within ourselves, if that makes sense. Oh, for sure. And um, do you think it's possible though to have, you know, that radical acceptance and curiosity about a partner if you actually have not 
prior to that connection cultivated that within and for yourself? Mm. So that's like the million dollar question, right? I think (laughs) so many people say it's not true that you can't love someone until you love yourself. And listen, I don't necessarily believe, I think, you know, we can do all the work on ourselves in the world. And it's like, I love to say, it's like, we're like sitting in our garage practicing. And then when we get in a relationship, we take that show on the road. And then it's like, where we're really in the space of like making it happen because our stuff comes to the surface in a whole different way. Once we're in a relationship with another person. And I think if we don't have that baseline of here's how I know how to draw from my tools and be in right relationship with myself and come back to my knowing of who I am and my own self-worth. And I'm not looking for anyone else to give that to me. Um, I think that often it's like a competing for energy and we're just attempting to like draw that energy from another person that it's really our work to offer to ourselves so that our cup is just like running over Oops, (laughs) with nothing but love to give that other person. For sure. And so what for you, if you could, and I'm, I think that this is probably an impossible question, but mm. if you could conceptualize, describe a really functional, healthy container mm. of a relationship, how would you describe it? Or can you? I love that question. I feel like, <laughs> you know, um, nobody's ever asked me that question and I love it so much. I just um, want the cliff notes to sit, get me straight to the <laughs> right answer there. and then I'll create it. <laughs> That's amazing. (laughs) You know, I think about the people whose relationships I really respect and would want something similar for myself. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really important for us to have expanders that give us Mm -hmm. sort of a conceptualization of what is possible. And I think that they are both really um, like full and embodied and proud of themselves for who they are and the way they show up in the world and what they're doing. And the relationship is like, the icing on the cake. You know, I think there's a really enmeshed like this, you know, we all like to joke like, yes, we understand that nobody completes us and that that like Tom Cruise line um, was, you know, not what we should be striving for. And yet, Kirsten, I find most of us still believe that someone is going to come into our lives and complete us. And, you know, a lot of times, like when we're in the space of singlehood, it's like, I'm just like waiting for this person (laughs) and then my life will fully take off. And what that ends up being is a lot of weight and pressure on a relationship and it just never works. You know, I think, um, I believe that love to me is a little bit different than what most of us are taught to believe it is, which is I love this person because of how they make me feel. And being discovered by another person is amazing. It feels euphoric. Like we all love it. Right. But what I believe is actually um, mature love and, you know, a deeper, truer love is when I meet someone and everything that they are inspires me to want to be the best, most full embodied version of myself and rise to meet them in the space that I witness them in. And, you know, they make me want to be a better version of who I am. And so it's more about like, I want to rise to meet you because you inspire me to be that versus I'm sort of drawing energy from you to feel like I'm somehow complete. Everyone pause the podcast, go back about one minute and listen to that again. Aww. <laughs> So beautiful. How and you, you touched on that there, you know, that whole beautiful uh, gift that being single, I think, offers us. And I think that, mm. you know, society has a lot of opinions about being single and absolutely does not celebrate it and absolutely does not honor it. Hence, many people run, hence, many people run from it and never give themselves the space and the peace in order to come into these types of conscious relationships that we're talking about. So can you speak to our single listeners or the listeners that maybe, you know, are about to leave a a long-term connection and are very afraid of this Mm. space that we don't honor as I believe as much as we should in our society. Yes. So beautifully said. And, you know, I hold a little bit of a different perspective around singlehood. And this is something that I've certainly cultivated in the last almost four years um, since my marriage ended, which is 
I think that there is a way that we have been taught to hold what it is to be in relationship that doesn't really serve our relationships. I think it is justified for us to join in partnership with another person when we have a shared mission for what we want to create together with our lives. Mm -hmm. And until then, I believe we are moving into a time where we hold that we should stay single until it is justified to join in partnership. So in my perfect world, singlehood is sort of the baseline, unless it's like justified to join in partnership. But I think that there's an intentionality to joining in partnership when, you know, we are like really solid for real, for real on our own that, you know, I believe and truly do feel at this point that my solitude and my singlehood and my life as I'm living it is so sweet and so mm. good that a relationship has to be just like, take my breath away, incredible and worth it for me to give that up, if that makes sense. And I think especially as women, that's not really how we're taught to hold it, right? It's like, she's amazing. Why is she still single? <laughs> Which if instead it were, she's amazing and she's not willing to give up her amazing life unless it's worth it, you know? Yeah, for sure. It's, um, you know, that, that just hit me square in the chest because it's, it's so true, but, um, oh, I, I had, you sparked a beautiful thought in me before, as you were speaking about that container of singledom and, and how it is, and it should be the baseline. Mm. But what I hear a lot from clients is, but I'm ready, but I've done the work, but I'm so ready for that, you know, to be seen, to be challenged in that way. My energetic response to that is always around the fact of that, well, if it's not there, it's not there for a reason and it's either <laughs> your reason or it's either their reason, but either mm. way, you're going to have to just accept the reason, even if you don't know what the reason is. From your perspective, what would you say to people that are feeling that way? We're so aligned, Kristen. I mean, I feel like you're speaking my language, sister. <laughs> That's it. Obviously, you're not because it's not here. And I think that, you know, we either trust in life's unfolding or we don't. We either trust in divine order and that everything comes to us in the precise moment that we're ready to experience it, or we don't trust that. But I love to say like the universe is not interested in our manipulation. <laughs> like it's well aware of the deeper layers of our intention. And so yeah. it's, you know, I, I trust you doesn't mean like I trust you in your universe, but I'm sort of like checking in to see like, mm -hmm. it's been a minute. Like how are we coming with that order I have? It's I believe that, um, yes, I have this desire. And so I am meant to experience that type of love and connection and I will, and I may not know what form it may come in. It may come in a form that surprises me, but I'm, you know, this is another Wayne Dyerism, which is, um, I'm open to everything and attached to nothing. And I think oftentimes our attachment to outcomes and the way that something needs to be delivered or show up in our lives is really sort of blocking our chi. It's like blocking our life force. And, and we're sort of in that resistance to what is. And so things can't flow to us and we're not in the full space of being willing to receive, you know? Oh, for sure. And I love that. You cannot outsmart the universe because the universe <laughs> is energy. Okay. And guys, yes. I have tried. Okay. I've tried. <laughs> <laughs> and if I can't, you can't. All right. So the end, right. I've really tried and intention is everything. So if you are single and you say, oh, I've been single for four years, mm. I've done all the work, I've read all the books. I'm so ready. I'm like, go back to your intention. Just like you said mm -hmm. then, like, what is the intention? Is the intention because did you do all that work just to get into the relationship or did you do that work to get into the relationship with yourself? So the relationship isn't something that you crave or need it is something that you simply desire and Absolutely. like you desire a piece of chocolate that piece of chocolate is going to make no difference on who I am or my value in the world it is just something so sweet to enjoy oh I love that <laughs> you say it like that you know this is an Abraham Hicks thing I feel like they often say um you didn't come here for the manifestation. You came here for the manifesting, right? So if we believe that we came here to sample the Raja, the, the force of life, the energy of all of the things that it is to be alive, then 
the actual thing is not the thing, right? And if we get the thing, it won't be as satisfying as we imagine it will be if we believe that's sort of an end point or point of arrival. And what I experience so often with couples is that they get married and then six months later, they're sort of like, is this all it is? It's like, you know, everything that I have been taught to believe this was mm. supposed to be, it really feels sort of anticlimactic. And it's not um, that end point or the happily ever after that we've all been sold. And so I'm feeling a lot of resentment and anxiety and just unsettled with like wanting something more. And I think that oftentimes is where our work begins and we can do it like with and for ourselves or we can do it in relationship. But at some point it's getting in right relationship with, like you said, the intention underneath the why we want what we want. I just, uh, there's so much I want to ask you. <laughs> so I may have to beg you to come back on the podcast <laughs> and I'm I sure there's to. so much our listeners will, you know, want to kind of pick your brain at. The biggest one for me is, um, Maybe this is a little teaser, but maybe this is a little me begging today to come back. But <laughs> I, I would love to dive into that whole feminine, masculine energy, not sex, mm. but that energy within relationships, but then also how do we cultivate that balance within ourselves so, and then show up to connections, whether they be with friends or lovers, that is going to be able to really expand that within ourselves. So um, if you have any questions around relationship, relationship dynamics and the energetics of relationships, the soul, I would say mm. of relationships, which is what we've kind of touched on today, um, please let me know in any which way or contact a name. We can discuss that out loud and have those conversations with and for you because I don't know about you, but relationships are so ever present and and mm. they do hold so much precious value for really um authentic reasons but then also for really conditioned reasons and um regardless of what kind of relationship you're in you're always in one with yourself so this is never going to be a topic that we could ever get to the bottom of so i would love to chat with you again um just to to think out loud, to share, to explore some of these concepts with you. Well, I mean, you are certainly a like-minded kindred soul. I can tell <laughs> just talking to you for a little bit. So I would absolutely love to, and, you know, masculine, feminine energetics are one of my favorite things to talk about. I just finished my first book on that precise topic. So absolutely. I would be thrilled to come oh back. Oh my gosh, stop it. it. When's anytime. the book coming out? It's coming out in May of next year. So oh my gosh. we're in the Listen, editing phase, but it's literally the obsession of my life. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm I'm stealing more of your time. Or Danae's never been down to Australia. So maybe we just have to get you down here. And oh gosh, I would love to. <laughs> you know, we'll just play in person. <laughs> I would love that so much. But yes, definitely would love to stay connected and speak to you again soon. Amazing. Well, where can people find you, you know, like I did to look at what you're doing and, and see what you're coming up with? Yeah, thanks, Kristen. Um, so I'm on all of the social medias as Danae Logan, D-E-N-E, -E, um, L-O-G-A-N. I think there's a dot between the Danae and the Logan on Instagram. Someone had taken Danae Logan. Um, but yes, um, yeah. And then I have my own podcast called Cheaper Than Therapy that I co-host with my friend Vanessa, who's also a therapist, and we just riff on all, all of the things, therapy, and um, the same conversations I'm having with you. Thanks so much for having me. Oh, thank you so much for making the time to be with us. You can catch all of Danae's links in the show notes. Uh, keep the conversation going on our Facebook community with any questions that you have, and hopefully we'll be able to ask you that ourselves very soon. Thanks, Danae. Thanks, Kirsten.